Good morning, good morning everybody and welcome to yet another magnificent African dawn. The sun is just struggling to peep up through the clouds there on the eastern horizon. And I'm just going to be quiet for two seconds to demonstrate the quietness of the dawn chorus this morning. It is a winter dawn chorus and you are most welcome on this, a live dawn safari. My name is James Henry. On camera today is Wiem Dorenbrock, uh, very fashionably dressed in safari attire today. Well done, Wiem. I've got my fancy pants on. He's got his fancy pants on and his uh, fancy shoes. Very nicely done, Wiem. Uh, <laughs> for the next three hours, you will be on drive with us here, and we're going to explore Juma. That's the little reserve we're on now. To the east of us, Cheetah Plains. We might pop along there a bit later and Brent may go off to the west, which is Arethusa. And those are the three reserves here in the middle of the Sabi Sands, which is in turn in the middle of the Kruger National Park, which is in turn in the middle of the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. Eight million acres of untrammeled African wilderness, and that's what we're going to be exploring today for the next three hours. Please do talk to us as we go along the way. Hashtag Safari Live if you want to talk to us on Twitter, or questions at wildearth.tv if you want to talk to us on the email. Now, we've come into this particular area not just to look at the sun that is uh, sort of threatening to rise up above that bank of misty cloud on the east, but we did see a hyena running this way, and there is an old hyena den. We are suspicious that the hyena den on Aubrey's Road, which is to the north of us, has moved. And so what we're going to do is go and check the old hyena den this side, and then we'll have a look and see if we can't find some tracks of leopard. Karula was last seen in this area with her two cubs. Likewise, Shadow's tracks, we think, came into this area a few days, in fact, yesterday evening. So maybe, with any luck, we'll pick up one of those two magnificent leopards. If we don't, there will be other wonders for us to explore and enjoy for the next three hours. Here we go. It's about 14 degrees Celsius, so not very cold. And Kyle, you were obviously listening to the damn camera as we were, as the morning broke today and you heard those lions calling and any guesses where they are. Kyle, I'm afraid because of where we live, and this the way it's designed, you know, we're sort of in a courtyard, so it's almost impossible to tell uh, where sound is coming from. So I don't know. I'm going to suspect up towards Bifflesook Dam. Brent is going to head towards Sydney's, towards the north, which is to the east, north and west of us. Then he'll head east, and we'll kind of do a southern loop and end up probably around Bifflesook Dam. I think they were north of our boundary, though, Kyle. All right, here's the little track that goes down to the old hyena den, a very picturesque part of the neighborhood. So if I was a hyena, I would consider this a very good spot to have my den. And look at that mist just sort of uh, gathering there in the lowlands. Very gentle, undulating topography is how I always describe this sort of landscape. And so we don't have any great canyons or any great mountains in this particular area, but you do get this gathering of mist where the air is much cooler in the winter down in the dips or troughs. And I think you'll probably find the sun has actually come up, but it hasn't managed to get through that bank yet. It was a very misty morning to start with, but that has very quickly disappeared. And while I say it's 14 degrees Celsius, which I think is around, if I'm not mistaken, oh, I've forgotten, I think about 65, 67 degrees Celsius, uh, Fahrenheit. That's not very cold. Really not very cold at all. Right, there does seem to be quite a lot of hyena activity on the road. None of it very fresh. Watch your heads, everybody. I know it's difficult to ask you to duck down at this early stage of the morning. We'll just ease our way through here and see if that hyena that came jogging along here or towards here has set up shop here. I 
suspect quite strongly that that is not the case. But we'll have a look anyway. It may have been that the hyena that was running this way, of course, hyenas have tremendously powerful senses of smell. So it's well possible that it smelt something in this area or heard something uh, meeting a hapless end, perhaps a diker going as a leopard jumped on it. And the hyena then will try and pilfer whatever meal it can. BMP, I don't think there's a great deal of new activity at this den. What do you think? No, I think it's vacant. You think it's vacant? I would tend to agree with you. So we'll just ease our way around here. That's the den side, everyone. That used to be where the hyenas liked to be. And let's just have a quick listen. We'll be very quiet for about 10 seconds. Well, VM awkwardly points the camera at me while I'm quiet for 10 seconds. So thank you very much, VM. There, we've got some kudu alarm calling. Now, I don't know if you heard that, everyone. It would have sounded like a sort of bark of a dog in the distance. Oh. It sounds like in the region of Treehouse Dam, which is over in that direction there. So Treehouse south Lake. of where we are now, Treehouse uh, Mine at the moment. And so we'll drive around there and see what we can find. That's quite exciting. Now, remember that while our eyes are not bad for animal eyes, um, our ears are greatly underrated as sources of finding game and animals because we tend to be, well, we just don't use them in the same way that our human ancestors used to use them, but our ears are pretty good. And so stopping and listening is a crucial, crucial part of what we do. Now that kudu could be just alarm calling at the hyena running past, it could be alarm calling at a leopard in the area, and that's actually where Steph had some kudu alarm calling yesterday morning, so I don't know, maybe there's a, there's a leopard that's had a kill there for a few days. Watch out there, Vumpi. <laughs> and morning glory, wonderful Twitter handle that. You say that surely there must be some kind of story to be told this morning, given the noises that were heard around here yesterday evening. I've no doubt there are, and we'll try and unpack them as the morning goes on, morning glory. I was just going to say that I thought the, you know, it's a very subdued winter chorus. There was a, a, I think I heard a lark calling very gently in the background. There was a babbler and perhaps a white-browed scrub robin as well. But otherwise, not a very loud morning chorus. I'm going to drive with quite quickly, just this is quite a distance to get around to the other side. But I have to stop here quickly, just so I know Viam's going to kill me here because he likes to film very large animals only. But just look at that mist there. It is too spectacular for words. Oh, wow. That's not, a, that's not the horizon, everyone. That is a bank of clouds that has sat upon the valley of the great Mulwati drainage line. All right, Vian, we can carry on. You like mist? Oh, yeah, good. Especially leopards in the mist. Leopards in the mist, yes. There are lots of elephant tracks all over the road here. Maybe we'll be lucky with some of them. And Tina, you say hyenas in the mist. Well, that's what we had this morning, running directly to where we heard that kudu alarming. And I don't know if you did hear it, but it's a sort of, like I say, a, a distant uh, dog's bark, but very deep and resonant. And it will move very easily through thick mist and through thick bush. It's a very low frequency sound. And you'll find that animals that live in this area and tend to live in thicker bush will make, if they do make any sound at all, will make low frequency sounds. They tend to travel better through the leaves. I don't know why. And Chris Rogue, you say you did hear the kudu barking. Chris Rogue, you obviously have a very fine set of speakers 
or earphones, and that's great. I always say that life is a little bit too short to listen to music through bad speakers, and the same goes for the bush. Right, here are some zebra, so we'll have another listen while we're over here. But let's just have a look at these zebras, which don't look particularly terrified by life indicating that they're unlikely to be attacked very shortly by lions. There's also a giraffe up ahead. Oh, it's, oh and an impala. It's all happening there. Let's quickly go forward. This is a great a great suite of animals. The first zebra sighting we had today was rejected by VM on account of the fact that he said we needed to find a leopard. This is a really nice herd of zebra actually. And there's our giraffe disappearing into the bush. They, of course, linking to the kudu and their low-frequency alarm bark. We're pretty sure that giraffe communicate with a low-frequency rumble, in, a bit like elephants do. And they, of course, are browsers, so they're often found in relatively thick bush. There we go. And just quickly, Viam, if you don't mind, the impala, I know that they're frightfully common, but there they are. Let us not... Uh, Look a gift impala in the mouth. No, but it would help if you not park behind the trees. I'm sorry about that, Vim. You know, you come back from leave and, you know, you could take, it takes a little while to get back into things. He's rubbing his horns there on the bush. Okay, I'm not going to tarry here, everybody. I think we should carry on and see if we can't find what that kudu was alarm calling at. Is that it right, Vim? Hmm? Who wants to leave now? Exactly, I want to leave now, Vim. <laughs> and my current favourite Twitter handle at the moment, Blue Butter Frog. Blue Butter Frog, you want to know when it's misty like this, is there a fresh smell? Yes, there is. There's always a fresh smell, but this one is particularly fresh because of the moisture in the air, absolutely. On a kind of a dry winter morning, you find that it is still fresh, but it does smell a bit more dusty. Now, Viam, this is around about where we last saw Shadow, of course, you and I, when we were still friends. I don't know, we stopped being friends. Yet. Well, you just started shouting at me, you know, and I, I, feel, I feel you don't like me anymore. See, he didn't deny it, everybody. He didn't deny it at all. I'm just thinking of... Uh, We've got some tracks of lions on the road. It's quite exciting. Here we go. Karen, you say the misty morning would also be nice for wild dogs. It most certainly would. These tracks have gone off the road. I can't see them. No, there they are. Lion tracks still on the road. Let's just drive slowly down here and have a listen. Brent, by the way, popped a tire before he even got going. That's why you haven't seen him yet. anything further at the moment. It's always a little bit it's a little bit difficult to decide how quickly to try and follow the tracks because you can miss them if you go quickly. But at the same time a lion like this will move big distances. Yeah he's going straight down the road here. 
Oh. I'm not going to stop and show you the tracks. Let's just keep going while they're on here and we're heading towards where the kudu was. And James Richard, do you want to know if the mist aids or hinders the tracking process? Uh, when it's like this, I don't think it makes any difference at all. Obviously, when it's very thick, James, well, then it can hinder it, certainly. Because, yeah, I've had experiences where we've been tracking lions, for example, and they will just suddenly appear out of the mist when the visibility is perhaps sh lower than 30 or 40 meters. Right, let's keep going along here. The tracks are still on the road. Now, this is where I thought the kudu were calling. There they go, they still go down the road here. It'd be nice to see him appear out of the bushes. I don't see him no more. Where is he that side? No. Not. No. Just going to be quiet for a second, everyone. Now, of course, while we're sitting here listening, a hyena would have come this way if it had heard something being killed. And we tend to think of hyenas as being sort of devious scavengers all the time. But the greatest scavenger out here, of course, is a male lion. They will steal from absolutely anyone. So he could well have come along here for the same reasons, except he, this kind of obvious walking along the road does tend to indicate that he's marking territory and maybe he was calling last night too. Let's see if he goes off the road and then we'll head down towards Treehouse Dam. I'll just go backwards and see if I can find his tracks. And there they are. I don't see where they go though. Vyampi, keep an eye on the other side there, if you don't mind. Nothing. Right, I think we should go down towards Treehouse Dam at this stage. We won't go backwards all the way, everyone. Just some of the way. There's a little bit of water at Treehouse Dam, so it's possible, you know, that something met its end while it was trying to have a drink there last night. Plenty of elephant tracks around. And Chris Rogue, I suppose while, I mean, dovetailing with James Richard's question, uh, does the moisture from the mist enhance the tracks? Yes, I suppose it would. In some ways, it would make them more obvious. Uh, they would reflect more light from the little bit of moisture on them. The contrast would be that much greater, especially if there'd been a heavy dew and the tracks were fresh. Then that dew uh, surface would, of course, be broken by any animal walking down the road and that would break the tracks and it would make it a bit more obvious. At the same time though, after a heavy mist and a heavy dew, if we'd had a lot of sunshine, that would then cake the tracks and it would make it quite difficult to age them. I don't see his tracks coming out here. So what we'll do is we'll continue off to the east and then do a sort of loop around. And as you were all saying or mentioning, the fact that there was so much noise and activity in the night that would surely have a story for us to tell this morning. So often though, when the prospects are great, 
because of noise and tracks and great expectations I find that <laughs> things tend to be quiet and quite the opposite happens when nothing has gone on during the night. We'll just have another little listen here. Remember, there's some lovely mist off to your left-hand side, your new favourite thing. I not go that far. Not that far, okay, fair enough. What on earth was that? Alrighty, while we discover what's happening around here, let's head across to Brent. He has uh, managed to fix his tyre, and I'll see you briefly. Welcome to the Sunrise Safari. Sorry we're a little bit late. Um, I'm absolutely filthy. I've been in the dirt, changing tyres, with very little help from the camera department. And there's the camera department. He didn't want to ruin his thumb no, this morning. Of not. <laughs> <laughs> so it's Brian and myself out on the Wendela. So the killer bees are out in full force on this gorgeous sunrise safari. And the mist is just burning off. We just want to show you how absolutely stunning that looks as we look through back to the Vuitella antenna with the sunrise and the mist sitting at treetops towards. Oh, around the buffles hook boundary and you can have a look there we go brian's gonna zoom Hang in on. for you now we have a slight camera malfunction but it's sorted look at that and you can see the voyatella antenna and that mist sitting in the treetops and what an absolutely wonderful time of the day to be out in the african bush now i'm a huge fan of the african bush i don't mind whether it's midday afternoon early morning but I think at the moment for me, these early winter mornings are just absolutely to die for. You've got fresh tracks, you've got animals vocalizing, and you've just got some of the most stunning scenery around. But it is going to be a very, very exciting sunrise for you, of course. We have Commander Bond in the other vehicle, uh, making lots of jokes and, and battling to track animals, but I'm only joking. So hopefully James has some luck with those lion tracks, because James is on lion tracks, I'm going to focus on leopard tracks this morning. And we had such a wonderful leopard day yesterday. I'm just hoping we can continue our luck. So let's get going and see what's out and about in the wonderful wilderness of Juma Private Game Reserve. <laughs> Anna Marie is on fine fettle this morning. Anna Marie would like to know what is the average life expectancy of a tire in the bush? Well, it depends who's been driving the car, Anna-Marie, to be honest. So, um, I would say our average tyre, oh, I mean, we've got some on the vehicles that are probably three or four years old. And uh, it just depends. So, we've got really thick tyres. They are 16 ply tyres on the base. So, there are 16 layers of rubber on the base. And, on the, and the base is not actually our problem most of the time. It's the side walls get sliced by sharp branches and uh, the side walls are eight ply. So, I will probably say our new tires have lasted very well, but I'd probably say it's about two years. Uh, we do patch, repair, and, and fix a lot. So, fortunately, uh, I've got big enough and ugly enough that I don't have to fix my own tires anymore. But uh, it's not a fun thing. You need tire levers and all sorts of things, and these are very hefty tires to get off the rim. Uh, but fortunately, we, we have wonderful gentlemen at the Juma workshop who fix our tyres for us for a small nominal fee and we're going to go now have a look for leopard tracks I'm still convinced Queen Karula and the cubs are hiding somewhere on Juma if you're not sure who Queen Karula is she's our dominant female leopard she's got two gorgeous cubs at the moment but uh, speaking of tracking I need to find those tracks so let's go to James who's got some lion tracks So we've come around the block, uh, literally the block. I think for some of you it must seem a bit strange for us to use language like that, but it, in the same way that you would refer to a city block, so we refer to the blocks here. And we've come around to see if those line tracks don't pop out. They haven't as yet, as far as I can see. 
So we'll just keep doing a loop around where the hyena went and possibly then where that male lion went. His tracks did not pop out going towards the dam there. There was an elephant very cross somewhere around the camp this morning. And I wonder if it wasn't sort of, if it didn't stumble across one of these predators. But who knows? Of course, the road is the bush newspaper of the morning and therefore will tell us the story of the night. And Lucy in South Bend, Indiana, goodness gracious, be there are mammals all over the place here today. There's a kudu. I don't think this is the same area where we heard her calling or him calling earlier. And that's a cow. Lucy, you want to know about the thick mist and where the animals move around more in it. Um, I think you'll find that they will move into areas much like they will in the dark, where they can see and hear better. So probably into more open areas for animals like the impala. There's an impala. I'll just sneak a little bit forward. Young male impala. particularly confiding at the moment. Um, I know that that one is behind a tree. There he goes. Join his mates. It always amazes me how, you know, with human beings, we often our legs are, are, you know, if you have to run through thick bush like this, you'll fall over the place, you'll trip over something. And yet with all four legs, these animals manage to dexterously sort of step between things, not break an ankle, not break a leg, as they step in holes and step over uh, bits and pieces of vegetation. There's our kudu cow. She's still there. Well, Joey, a very nice question. Sorry, I think often, you know, one forgets that the perspective on the screen is difficult to, you know, it's difficult to gauge the actual size of animals. You want to know how tall a kudu is? Well, that kudu is about four and a half feet. In fact, no, probably five feet at the shoulder, maybe even a little bit taller than that. So about five feet, which is about one and a half meters or so at the shoulder. In fact, even more than that. No, about one and a half meters at the shoulder. So she's quite tall. She's by far the tallest antelope that we have out here. Right, Viam, we've had enough of the kudu. Mm -hmm. Carry on, shall we? It's turning into a rather glorious morning. The light is remaining soft. Yesterday the sun came up and it immediately kind of washed out. Those kudu and impala looked particularly relaxed about life. So what we'll do is we'll go, there's another road along here to the right hand side of your screen. We'll take that one, see if we'll come up with anything there. And if we don't, we'll go back to those last tracks. You got, you see them there? The right hand side. Oh, there they are. That's right. Well spotted them. Where he's gone from there? We just check the junction here. Of course, they are doing some road modifications, and so some of the areas are very crusted with hard soil. And it's difficult to find tracks. You see him there, Vium? I didn't see him either. I think it's logical to assume that he went left. Why is that? Because he's walking on the left of the road. We don't see. All right, I'll go with your logic. He may have just walked across the block.
Anyway, we haven't been up here yet, so let's pop up this way. No one's been down this road. I don't see his tracks here. No. Right. I'm in two minds as to what to do here. I think we should go down Finn's Road. Simply because that's where the hyena was going and I didn't see the lion track coming across here. He's getting quite uh, full of himself, this cameraman, isn't he? He's giving me all sorts of instructions. One likes to think of oneself as being in charge. Is he there? <laughs> so he is. <laughs> well spotted. <laughs> Maybe we should leave him in charge. There's a dike in there. Then look, I spotted a diker, you see? You see him in there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just to prove that I'm not totally blind. That is the common or grey diker. Now, where did this lion go? I can hear the very loud sound of Brent Leo Smith's voice not too far from here. He's up over there. Um, he could actually be at another sort of 10 or 12 kilometers north of us. Jody, you say you think you saw an antelope hanging in the, a tree about a hundred meters back. Are you sure? We'll have a look. We'll have a quick look. I suspect my great tracker VM Durenbrock would have managed to see that, but it's not impossible. So what we'll do from here, I know Brent is sitting around quarantine, so we'll head off towards the east. VM, do you see any antelope hanging from a tree, lifeless? Jody, this is about a hundred meters back from where we were. But I don't see anything. But keep looking. Thank you for that. I think what we'll do is head across to the east now. Brent, as I say, I can hear his voice on quarantine clearings and that's where this road goes. So the last line track we had is over there and it's going up the road, but I suspect quite strongly it will cut off towards the east. Oh, that's always a nice thing to see on game drive. And Rachel, you want to know about when the best time of day for tracking is. Rachel, now is the best time of day for tracking. Just as the sun's popped up, low on the horizon so it gives great contrast you can see the different indentations of the tracks and that's basically the best time to track and obviously most of the predators are active during the night time so when the tracks at least when the morning breaks so the tracks are normally pretty fresh if you try and track in the afternoon when the sun is also at the sort of same angle well a you're going to lose light and b it's quite likely that if you're tracking a predator the tracks are from the night before and so they're less likely to be very fresh. No, nothing in there. Let's keep going. We will stop at whatever else we see, but we're heading vaguely in the general direction. There's the buffalo. In 
curious one. You say you too saw the thing that Jody thought may be a an antelope hanging from a tree. Uh, you thought it was a branch. I think it's quite likely. I have many, many times been fooled into thinking that a hanging piece of sort of dead tree is in fact a dangling antelope leg. That is a buffalo, everyone, uh, lying very relaxedly in the thick bush there. Again, it doesn't seem to have seen a lion too recently, does it, Vian? Mm. Just mm. up in the tree there, you can see that the spider, a number of spiders seem to have caught some mist. Which is very pretty indeed. Is it not? Mm -hmm. yeah. Spiders in the mist. Spiders in the mist, yes. Just somehow it's not going to be as popular a movie as a Gorillas in the Mist, is it? I doubt it. Spiders in the Mist. <laughs> okay, let's carry on. Righty. There seems to be a great plethora of bird life out here this morning. But maybe we'll find some hornbills sitting on the tops of the trees, catching the first rays. There's one. It's not sitting on the top of a tree, though. We're just going to keep going through here for the next little while and see if we can't pick up more tracks. Like I say, there has been quite a lot of activity around quarantine where that last track was heading. The general direction was in this direction. There's another male impala. Now look at him. I don't know if you can see behind his eyes or around his eyes. His face looks quite blackened and bruised. And I'm interested by that because I thought they would have stopped fighting with each other. But many of the impala are showing signs of the rat. They've got really kind of damaged eye sockets and their faces look battered and bruised and they're often quite stiff in the front of the shoulder from where they've been boxing with each other fighting over ladies very bad idea that's a young male he wouldn't have been doing too much fighting and you can see how he's fluffed up his fur in order to trap the air underneath it on this well relatively cool morning it's not very cold yet but he won't have, he doesn't have, you can, I don't know if you noticed, we saw it very briefly with that other adult. His, this guy's eyes look absolutely fine. The other chap looks dazed and bruised. Oh, that's wonderful, Viam. Very nice. That does tend to happen to me quite a lot, really. See an animal, and it relieves itself of any excess weight. Right, that's the end of that sighting. Thank you, Viam. Now this road we're on is called Ingwe Alley, which basically means Leopard Alley. I have seen a few leopards here, but not very many. Now let's just try and get a look at this impala's eyes again. With well, his face, generally. He's not being very confiding, in fact he's being plain irritating going to be impossible to film staring straight into the sun. So let's carry on. We're going to pop out on what is known as Twin Dams Road, which is the road that goes through the sort of middle of the reserve, parallel with the Great Valley of the Mulwati drainage line. Watch your head here, Vumpi. Oh, just before I go underneath this, you'll be quite interested to know, some of you, who like uh, vegetation. Uh, very few of us like vegetation more than we like lions, but still it's quite interesting. You'll see here that the leaves have started to change color. I mean, this particular branch is going to die because it's been broken off by elephants. But this is the sort of autumnal color, and that's the most common one. So there is a little bit of red, but largely it goes yellow almost immediately, and then the leaves drop from the trees. So we don't have a great swathe of maroons and yellows and browns 
like you might say in the boreal forests or in Canada or in many parts of the United States. That's a really nice artistic picture there, Liam. It's very subtle. Mm. Right, on we go. Drongo sitting on the branch. Get a quick look at him. Oh, don't fly away. There he is. That's the forktail drongo. He's not alone in this tree. There are a couple of leaf gleaning birds. There's a woodpecker. You hear it? We'll see what else we can see here. Oh, there's a red-headed weaver um, without a red head. You hear that woodpecker? Can you see him, Jim? Uh, uh, yeah. You got him. Yeah, uh, my viewfinder was fogged up. Fogged up. I think he's gone now. Now I can hear him. There's a scimitar bull. That's the scimitar bill I think you saw just hop around there. Yep, see the scimitar, scimitar shaped bill, very appropriately named bird, part of the hoopoo group. You can hear an oriole calling. A beautiful bird party here, you can hear a bulbul calling. It, tap tapping away from the lightness of the tap, I would say it's probably a cardinal woodpecker, but I can't see it. Uh, you know where it is, I think it's actually further away. I think it's on that, there it is. Follow the dead tree up the main trunk, and that's it. There we go, he's somewhere there. Yeah, that's in there. You got him. A little bit too down, but. There. There you can just see him there moving in the middle of your screen. And what is he? The red head. Yes. <laughs> the first time I ever said to somebody, you know, I saw a woodpecker, he had a red head. Um, this was a, a fairly harsh trainer I had. He slapped me about the head and he said, they all have red heads. I'll show you a picture, everybody, of what I think it is. He's also got a bit of brown in front of the red, and that's going to be quite telling. There are no further alarm calls though, so I don't think our lion is too close by here unless he's gone to sleep, which of course being a lion he may well have. So what we're looking at there is a male cardinal woodpecker, and if you look there you can see him, and yes he does have that very distinctive red head, but he also had that little bit of brown in the front there, that was very distinctive. And very light tapping. He's the smallest woodpecker that we get here. Alrighty. Now apparently, even though we get four woodpeckers here, and South Africa has about nine species of woodpecker, apparently the family the woodpeckers belong to is very poorly represented in Africa and much better represented in the New World, where you get, of course, the, the enormous woodpeckers are about a foot long. There's another kudu. There's plenty of general game around here, Vim. Hmm. North or south, Vim? Um, south. I agree. Safari Dean, you want to know which bird Vim reminds me of? <laughs> I'm going to be careful here, of course. Um, VM, you remind me of a um, a Scops owl, I think. I think a Scops owl. Would you like to be a Scops owl? They're not fast enough. They're not fast enough. They're pretty fast. <laughs> what bird do you want to be? Uh, 
called a falcon. A falcon. Okay. Not sure I'd describe you as a falcon. I'll describe Brentley Smith as a hardy dog. Yes, Brentley o. Smith is a little bit like a very large hardy dog. Yes. <laughs> That's got the final control in absolute hysterics. I can hear Geraldine laughing her head off. <laughs> I do hope that Kirsten will tell Brent that um, to be him described him as a hardy dog. Right, let's keep our let's keep our focus here. Let's see if our line didn't pop across here. <laughs> Brent says he's coming up with something for VM. I suspect I will be the uh, the target of his. Oh yes, he's coming up with something for me. I didn't call him a Harley Dar, but it's going to be me that bears the brunt. I'll tell you what it'll be, everybody. It'll be something like a. It'll be something like a a wax, um, a wax bill or a Cape Penduline tit, which is a very small bird like this, or a you know bumblebee hummingbird, something small. I say budgie. Or a budgery guy, yes. There, VMP is the most uncolourful member of the Turaco family. That is the grey go away bird, which always looks slightly like a startled punk. I feel. And again, we can just hear a very subtle dawn chorus today. You can hear the crested barbet. And that luri or taraco is just enjoying the first rays of the sun. And a very good question from Stay Big, uh, the answer to which I don't really know. You say, why do we refer to birds as sitting on a branch when they're much more clearly standing or perching? Um, it's just one of those quirks of the English language, I suppose. And uh, I, I guess, I guess it's because they look like they're relaxing, maybe? It's a very good point. I, I, <laughs> I've honestly never thought of that at all. Wonder where that lion went. Wimpy, mm -hmm. what do you think? We need to go check um, Gauri Main. Gauri Main. Okay, Wim, we can go and check Gauri Main. If that's what you want to do. You ask me? Yeah, no, no. I'm happy to do that. That's a very nice point. And Chris Rogue, who says that as much as Viam eats, he should be known as a spoonbill. Yes, Viam does eat a great deal. Often he brings a spoon with him on drive, and uh, he uh, often leaves it about the place. Viam, what did you bring for picnic today? Uh, I think I got an archie. An archie. An archie, everybody, I think is called a um, clementine in most parts of the world. the citrus fruit, the peels of which will no doubt find their way under my seat at some stage. He also gets on the car with a very large flask of coffee most mornings. What's the current mix, Bjorn? Three spoons of Milo. Yes. One spoon of coffee. Yes. Um, like a dash of cream. Yes. One spoon of sugar. Right. Water that's quite a that's quite a mix. There's been plenty of elephant activity around here. You can see the leaves all over the road. Not very fresh elephant activity. Let's just drive slowly through here. rather interested as to where that lion should have gone. We're obviously going in a different direction, but somebody else has checked quarantine clearings. So, I'm not sure where he went.
Hello, Gareth. Gareth, you ask a very valid question as to where have all the woodland kingfishers gone? Gareth, the woodland kingfishers have absconded into tropical Africa uh, from Senegal in the west, I think probably most of the way across to the Sudan in the east. And they'll be in that area just south of the Sahel. So we've got the Sahara Desert, then you've got a band of arid land underneath the Sahara called the Sahel. And they'll be just below that. Uh, where it is now summer and they like to eat the insects that are on offer there. And uh, it's possible that you might see a woodland kingfisher in its first year not migrated. I saw one very late um, in April, late in April, a sort of youngster which didn't quite have its adult plumage yet. And you might find one or two migratory birds who were born this year or during the last breeding season. They might not migrate, but I think it's highly unlikely. And I certainly haven't seen any now for at least four weeks. But that's where they go. And Tony, lovely question from you. You obviously know about birds, you know about vultures, and you say, do we get the bearded vulture here? No, Tony, we don't get the bearded vulture. You say, do they stick to the mountains? Yes, they do. And largely down to the high felt, where sort of between the Free State and the Drakensberg, or the Natal Drakensberg, and they hang around there. And the bearded vulture, everybody, has the remarkable sort of habit of picking up a bone, taking it up to a great height, and then dropping it on the rocks in order so it, that it might get the marrow from the middle of the bone. And we had a long discussion yesterday about marrow and the nutritious nature of marrow in the bone. Here's another impala, a U. And there's a ram suddenly realized he's been spotted. Look, he's only got one horn. Poor fellow. And that's, he's lost from fighting over girls. He also seems to be deeply confused as to which direction he should be walking in. Oh, there are a whole lot of them back there. Many of the impala rams, although the females have almost certainly been mated already, or been covered, that testosterone in their bodies which escalated to extremely high levels during the dark phase of the moon in May will now, although it will be coming off and dropping down, it will still be quite strong and so they still won't be particularly pleasant to each other. They'll be still filled with a sense of competition. Hmm. Righty. Maybe I should just quickly, before we carry on, show you a picture of a bearded vulture so that you know what we're talking about because they really are quite impressive birds. And I can also just make sure of my memory of its distribution. Where is he? There he is. The bearded vulture. He doesn't look very vulture-like. He's a very good looking fellow. And there he lives in the mountains. That's his distribution there. You can see the map of South Africa. I'll just cover it with my shadow. That pink bit is the tiny little area in which he lives. Very nice bird. There we go, Bimpy. Do you feel more knowledgeable now? And Jeffrey in Texas, I don't think I've heard from you for a while, Jeffrey. Nice to hear, hear your voice again in my ear, even though it does sound a bit like Kirsten. Um, you want to know what are some of the animals that the indigenous people out here might use for medicine or for traditional uses? Well, the vultures, of course, are suffering horribly, we think. One of the major reasons that their numbers have plummeted so hugely in the last few years is because they are used in traditional medicine quite a lot. There is a large tree that I will be unable to move by hand. Um, and 
interesting to see what's the best way around is. And Jeffrey, they, because of their association with death, there's often the thought that they have second sight, you know, so that they're able to see the future or they're able to predict death or something like that. And so they are used quite extensively in traditional medicine. Then other animals that would be used would be hyenas, quite often. Parts, hyena parts fetch enormous prices with the traditional healers out here. Lion parts as well, there was, in fact, I think yesterday, a very large bust. The cops arrested a whole lot of people with lion feet. So they are in high demand. Um, and then the other big one, of course, which you don't see very often here, is pangolin. And you know Brent saw a pangolin the other day, and that's a, the scaly anteater, if you like. And their scales, keratinous scales, made of much the same material as rhino horn, for example, are considered to be either auspicious or used in various kinds of potions and concoctions. So those are the major ones, Jeffrey. But I just must reiterate here that although, yes, there are hugely deleterious effects of, because of the population numbers, and so yes, vultures are being affected largely by the depredations of, of in local healers who are trying to get parts. And Uh, there's, uh, there's often a thought that, you know, a place like the Kruger National Park is necessary because local people will denude wildlife if they're left to their own devices. When in actual fact, of course, the Kruger National Park was only a necessity and most national parks have only be around the world have only become a necessity since the advent of uh, white settlers and their guns. And they took out huge numbers of wildlife. And that's the main reason that we have national parks at the moment, because that's why, why they needed to be protected. And I think it's just very important to bear that in mind when we talk about indigenous cultures and the often conflicted space that is the borders of these national parks because of the poverty-stricken uh, people that live on the borders. Nice question, James Richard, to which I'm afraid, like Jamie apparently the other day, didn't know the answer. I don't know the answer. You say, is there a local word for feather? Yes, there is almost certainly a Shangan word for feather. I don't know what it is. The Shangan word for bird is Shinyanyana, which I think is a lovely bird, a lovely word. And most of the species here will have a local Shangan name as well. But Shinyanyana is the sort of generic term for bird. And I imagine feather is probably quite a similar word. And I don't know of any folklore around the use of feathers. But starting soon, of course, in this area, and you've met him already, is Hubert. And Hubert, of course, is going to be doing a lot of our game scouting, our tracking out here. And he is from the local area, and he has a tremendous amount of indigenous knowledge. Oh, BMP, that's a that's a hornbill. Yeah. Very nice. Um, and so, you know, you can read a lot about supposedly indigenous uses for things, but for me, it's much better to get it from the horse's mouth, as it were, because uses of traditional or traditional uses of plants and animals and beliefs have changed so profoundly over the last two or three hundred years that chatting to a guy like Hubert when he comes back from leave is going to be far more, I think, interesting than reading these things, sort of things out of books. That's, that's true indigenous knowledge now. Now apparently there are squirrels alarm calling at the Juma Pan, but I'm not going to rush there unless something is seen having a drink. We're going to keep going along here Squirrels will alarm call at just about anything. And Brenty, I think, is in that area.
And Jeffrey, you're wondering if there are any programs around to stop um, the use of you know local products by traditional healers and that sort of thing. And the answer, Jeffrey, is yes, absolutely. I mean, one of the major conservation nightmares from a traditional point of view has been a religion called the Shembe religion, which is a derivation, it's a sort of Christian-derived religion. So it's not, I mean, it's not entirely indigenous at all, but it's those, that particular sect, it's a Zulu sect of religion, has got it in their heads to, or it's become traditional that everybody who belongs to the religion has got to have a leopard skin pelt uh, hanging around their necks. And of course that is just not sustainable and there are thousands of leopard skins that because of this religion and it's um well like any religion you know it creates a certain amount of fervor and rev and uh, people will spend enormous amounts of money getting the right kit in order to connect with whatever deity it is that they think that they're connecting with and leopard skins have been a major issue with that and there's some very successful programs now where uh, conservationists have gone in and they've created synthetic leopard skins and the leopard, that seems to be taking over and so that's one great example of conservation efforts that have uh, you know they've communicated and engaged with the traditional belief well a semi-traditional belief and had a great conservation effect now we're driving along the southern boundary and we just might be very lucky to find tracks of Karula or even shadow going either north or south but with any luck north this was our sort of original plan this morning the drongos are going crazy they're catching things out of the air they're hawking insects just and it's going to be almost impossible for you to see but they're flying around and every so often you'll see them stop and they're catching insects there must be some kind of bloom they're also having a bit of a fight a bit of a scrap there's some elephants calling that's really cool that's the forktail drongo everyone pretty common bird in these parts um joey you asked a question it has now completely slipped my mind. If Shadow came across Karula's cubs, you say, what would she do? Joey, Shadow would almost certainly leave them alone. I don't think she would be a threat to them. Whether she would recognize them as her kin, I don't know. Uh, if she came across them without Karula, uh, it would be very interesting to know. I don't know what she'd do. I'm pretty 99% sure she wouldn't kill them. If, however, uh, Sindile came across them, well, that would be a different matter because he is a male and he's now, well, he's not quite a fully grown adult yet, but that could be a little bit more dangerous for Karula's cubs. But it would be very interesting. I mean, the great question, of course, is will Shadow and Sindile meet up again? And if they do, will Shadow, um, you know, w what will happen with Shadow's cub and Sindile? Will, what kind of interaction will there be there? And in my experience, uh, young male leopards who meet their siblings from a later litter tend to be, while not a along the road hoping that we're going to bump into Sindile and we'll know him immediately of course because he will have a collar on. And the Sabi Sands is monitoring his position all the time. We don't get information every day on where he is. E.B. E. Murphy, you say, would we have any more luck drawing out the predators if we travelled along the reserve um, on a mountain bike? E.B., yes. Uh, well, no, we wouldn't draw them out. But certainly lions do react to bicycles. They don't like bicycles. And they often, well, sometimes they do like bicycles. And they, they, they seem to be mesmerised by the spokes going around. And you hear quite a few stories of cyclists 
riding in wildlife areas having to get off their bikes as soon as they see lions because lions of course will react to you on foot completely differently to the way that they will react to you when you're on a bicycle. Now I don't see any further leopard tracks along here. So we'll turn back towards the north at the next road. And it's interesting, Brent reckons that Karula is still on the reserve. And I think that's probably quite likely. Because we have not seen her tracks going out. It's always funny, you know, after you get back from leave, it takes a few days to get back into what's going on with the animals and just develop another feeling for the place. You do definitely have some kind of second sense or sixth sense, second nature after a while in an area and you tend to sort of almost feel what's going on rather than have to look in a completely linear fashion. There's our giraffe from earlier this morning. Two giraffe, one female, one young male. young male. It's nice to see Vian, isn't it? You don't seem very excited, Vian. Now, if I'm not mistaken, giraffe is not your favorite, is it? Vian's shaking his head and somebody's been told a very hilarious joke on a game drive just to the south of us. Now, look how full his cheeks are. Oh, sorry, we're on the wrong giraffe now. That's right, she's also got quite full cheeks, but he's got even fuller ones. He's chewing his cud. Don't go behind the bush, you beastly animal. Typical, typical. Anyway, this female is looking quite fixedly towards the east. she can see. Now watch her cheeks. Well, she's definitely seen something there. Well, that is the direction that we're going to sort of head off in. You can hear some Franklins and you can maybe hear some Hornbills going just behind. Now watch her neck. No, she hasn't swallowed yet. Come on, swallow. Endless chewing if you happen to eat only vegetation. Breaking down the cellulose and lignin, which make up the structural material of the plants and of course it's almost impossible to digest. It's why you and I cannot survive on a diet of combretum leaves and zizifus quite apart from the thorns that would get into our tongues, have hey, you? Yeah, that would be horrible. It would be horrible, wouldn't it? Now watch her throat. Ooh. Did you see that, Pim? Mm. I did. That was the bolus coming out of the front chamber of the stomach, back into the mouth, and now she gets to re-chew the food that she ate a little bit earlier. And as I always say, I'm so glad I'm not a ruminant. Right, it'll be great. You think it'd be nice to re-eat your food? Yeah, I'm just put the uh, camera back on the giraffe quickly. I think it's seen something. Thanks. <laughs> that, of course, was a ruse, everyone. I wanted to put on my sun hat, and I didn't want you to be blinded by my balding pate. On we go. Right, Brent Leo Smith has managed to stop his filming. Well, Jandre has been filming him. And so he is ready to give you an update. And I will continue into the rising sun. I'm so happy to be back. I am definitely not made for non-live filming. Apparently, I don't, don't embrace the acting. 
I like being live and I like looking for animals. It's much more fun than driving up and down the same 25 meters of quarantine. So, there are lions roaring to the north. There are lion tracks all over the place. And um, what I actually had to do to get out to be live with you is I brought my stick and I hit Jandre on the head and we've left him unconscious in quarantine so we can actually go look for some, some, some animals. No, I'm only joking. He's back there still behind me, oh. irritating me. But um, he's given us permission okay, Jandre, to, go, to go look for some animals. So off we go. I'm really excited not to be doing behind the scenes again. Um, and I'm very excited to have you on the vehicle. So if anyone has just joined, Jandre has been making Brian and I wave our hair in the morning light, driving up and down the same 25 meters of quarantine. Brian and I, as a joke, during in between one of the serious shots, we did, we did a bit of a head banging with our long hair. We rocked out. Uh, but now I'm hoping to go find another creature who's got long, beautiful locks like Brian and myself, and that's a male lion. And uh, if you want to ask us questions about what we're doing, if you're a little bit more interested, normally I say ask us questions about the bush, but uh, this has been a very interesting experience for me. So I'm happy to talk about it with you. So pop me an email at questions at wildlife.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And uh, you don't only have to ask questions about what we've been doing behind the scenes. Uh, you can also ask us about the wonderful natural world that surrounds us. Oh, I'm so excited to be away from that. So, I did hear some elephants as well while we were doing behind the scenes, somewhere in this general vicinity. But I'm more interested in finding those lion traps. But of course, we will have a look at anything that is not genre with the camera. And, and has a heartbeat, or doesn't. I honestly find every dry blade of grass more entertaining than uh, being <laughs> behind the scenes. But I understand we have to, oh, hello, it's, it's a heartbeat. Very pretty little heartbeat. There we go. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. There we go, some beautiful Inyala. The big male. Oh, it's, look what he's eating. Now he is eating a Timburti tree. So there are very few animals that eat Timburti trees. And when they do, they are normally eating it because they've got stomach problems. Uh, an infestation of tapeworms or fluke worms. And they eat this highly noxious tree to purge their system. And Yala are not the only species, kudu, baboon, black rhino, elephant, giraffe. Now the milky latex from a Timberti tree, if you get it on your skin, it'll actually burn you. And it's used traditionally uh, in traditional medicine to burn off warts. So very, very potent. Now that poison in the Timberti tree is so potent that even if you inhale the smoke of a fire that's got Timberti wood in it that's very dry. Oh look, there we go. It's coming out into the open. Hello little one. You will get highly nauseous. Even worse if you cook meat or any food on that fire. That smoke, those fumes go into the, in, into the food and makes you very, very ill. And there we go. Such a beautiful antidote. Hello. Okay, there we go. She's crossed down. They're going to keep moving down this little dry creek system. Uh, there's lots of evergreens around these little river systems. So it's the best place for food if you're a browser, which in Nyala are. Now, we're going to move on. Justin is wondering, what are the medicinal plants? that you get in Kruger. Well, there's a lot, Justin, and quite often some of the medicinal plants can help. Right, so sorry about that. Brent, of course, uh, has gone black screen, so I don't really have anything particularly interesting to say to you other than there's a zebra here. Oh, 
didn't get a lot of warning there. Whew. Luckily we're so sharp, isn't it, VM? Mm-hmm. We practice. Yeah. Same lonely zebra. I'm sure he's got some friendies in the bush there. He's got a hornbill friend just above him. Two hornbill friends. It's nice to see. We're going to go up the road, everyone, where I had initially intended going when Viam spotted the lion tracks again. And we'll see if we can't find something there. Sandy, a nice one from you. I suspect born of the fact that you've heard that zebra are very nasty as zoo animals or to keep to try and keep domestically. You say, are they a danger to humans in the bush? No, uh, in general not. Well, I mean, look, every, every animal out here is a potential danger to human beings because we are physically pathetic specimens compared with everything out here. But by and large, I'd say 99% of the time, zebra will run away from you. If, however, you were to somehow, and it would be almost impossible, but if you were to somehow corner a zebra so that it felt threatened and it felt like it had no option but to attack in order to make you go away, then you would be in some trouble, yes. Then they would be very nasty. And they are known to be particularly nasty to each other and to other species. So Sandy, yeah, I mean, we've seen many, many times we've seen zebra and where, you know, you wouldn't sneak up on a buffalo bull if it knew you were there because it would either move away it would show, and, and be much more likely to come towards you. A zebra will almost universally move away. So it's perfectly safe to sneak up on them in the bush and try and kind of, uh, uh, you know, you can approach them very nicely, safe in the knowledge that they're highly unlikely to turn around and attack you. But were they to decide to attack you, I imagine it would be very unpleasant indeed. That hyena disappeared. I know where it went, and likewise the male lion. All right, let's just quickly go and get an update from Brent. He does have signal again, which is good. And I'll keep on this road. So of course our loss of signal I blame on Jandre. Yeah. Everything that goes wrong today is Jandre's fault. Because of what they are. I can't explain how, how much it hurts me when I know there are fresh tracks and animals about to drive up and down on the same 25 meters. I did we did have some fun though. I nearly ran over him once, which was really enjoyable. His face. <laughs> turned the car towards him while he was running next to us. But let's get a bit more serious. So we're going to try to focus on finding tracks and, and Justin is asking about medicinal plants and uh, unfortunately the medicinal plant I wanted to show you <laughs> and was right in a dip where we had very bad signal. I will keep a lookout. I know there's some coming up but uh, a, lot of, a lot of trees will have medicinal properties not all of them valid a lot of them are psychosomatic so it's a it's a thought rather than anything but a really good one to know and especially if you have little children out of the bush there's a couple of tree species that um, have are very high in tannins so what that does is it acts as a little a painkiller and numbing device so Baby elephants also feed off these two tree species. Now, elephants don't normally feed off these species. This year is a bit different because of the drought. Uh, but we have a spike thorn, a gymnosporia. Now, this is how much I love you guys. And Brian loves you as well. And Jandre definitely loves you. So I'm going to get Jandre a big bunch of leaves. I'll eat all these leaves, man. There we go. So there we go. Jandre? There we go. Now, let's go around to where Jandre is. So we make sure he puts it in his mouth. Hello, he has his leg. Say hello, Jandre. 
So the gymnosporia, the spike thorn, is very, very high in tannins. So if you chew it, so basically what starts happening is your mouth starts drying. So it actually sucks up all the saliva and if you chew it, excuse me, for long enough, not only will it dry out the mouth, so it also numbs. You can actually start feeling it on the edge of your gums almost immediately after chewing for a little bit. That we're not really going to get a numb mouth from the amount we've eaten, but you can actually feel the slight numbing. And Jandre is eating more. He's an idiot. Um, so it actually starts numbing. So this is used in. <laughs> sorry, Jandre. Let me just ignore him. Um, this is used in traditional medicine for dentistry for toothaches. So there's a couple of different species that have that very high tannin. Um, that, that, that can be used and, it, and I've actually had trackers before um, with a sore tooth and not being able to go to the dentist literally chew wads of um, gymnosporia to, to stop that oh, Andrew is trying to get hold of me on the radio standing by Andrew so Andrew's just looking for an update I'll be with you in a second uh, nothing further than for I'm busy checking Buffalo so cut line, uh, but no updates. Oh no! Now we've got line tracks of at least two or three lions. Uh, Andrew, I've, I do have an update now. I've got Nkonzo Olesambi and Gala heading west on Buffalo Zook cut line, we gotta go shortcuts just near the Buffalo Zook sign. So, copy will do. Now, there we go. You can see we've got quite a few tracks there. And if we come out a bit wider, Brian, so you can see, where's my finger? There's one there one there and there's a, a more difficult one to see over there so there's at least three so this is more than likely the Inkahuma pride just from the area we're in and, and where they were found in Buffalo's Hook yesterday so we've changed our plan we're no longer heading down the long road to the east we're going to try the very short road to the west because our northwestern corner of Juma is just up here and I've got a feeling if we're going to see them, we're going to see them on that big open area around Sydney's waterhole. So, hopefully, uh, a not so clever buffalo wandered down and managed to run and die on our side of the boundary. I'm going to make sure they haven't gone straight north. No, they're still here. Okay, fingers crossed, guys. I'm uh, definitely feeling a bit of luck. I think we deserve a cat after behind the scenes. So you can just see the lion track still heading west. Now, since we're following lion tracks, Lynn in Michigan. Uh, has heard us and, and I think all of us talk about walking on foot and 90, 99% of the time you walk in to lions on foot during the day, they run away or move off. And Lynn's wondering if she's got cubs, is her behavior going to change? Most definitely. And she, it, she's possibly going to be a bit more aggressive. Normally what they'll do is they'll give you a growl when you, you're still quite far away, so you know not to go any closer. But I mean, I have actively been actively searching for a lion den and been charged close enough that I've actually had lions spit on my legs and been blasted with sand. So they are slightly more aggressive and they're more likely to charge. But when you get charged by a lion, there's a very simple rule. A noisy lion's a safe lion, a quiet lion's a dangerous lion. If a lion's going and shouting at you, it's telling you to go away. So, if the lion's coming quietly, uh, it's time to sort of make your peace. And I've only ever really, really been charged quietly by a lion once in my life. And that was in the Eastern Kruger. 
and it was by two males and they, they came completely silently from 70 meters and they stopped at about uh, blasting my track and myself with sand and you know, that was definitely a scary lion experience I've had and uh, <laughs> some bad words shouting, uh, but it was a very Hello everybody, we just got off here in Philemon's dip to see if we could maybe find some further evidence of the lion tracks. The last one we had was over there and I haven't found anything in this drainage line at this stage. So we're going to head up towards quarantine. First, however, <laughs> this is really cool. In that hole that the elephants dug, and of course the elephants will dig for water, they're very good at digging for water. There was a snail and he's just seeking out, of course this is a small example of a giant land snail and what the snail is doing is seeking out the last moisture of course before they form a crust of sand over the top there, over the foot and that's how they'll remain for most of the winter unless they're found by some sort of predator of course which will then eat them possibly without garlic and butter, which is distasteful. Not so. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put him back exactly where he was. And then we'll continue. There's a delicious smell here, and I think it's that wonderful plant called Hemizygia pretorius, or pretoria, and I don't know, I don't think it has a common name, but it just smells like um. I don't, it's very difficult to describe. It smells like a comforting smell of home, almost. Right, we'll leave that snail there. I can't see any of the hemizygia, though. So maybe, ooh. Maybe it's something else. No, it's not that. Anyway. There it is. We're going to go up onto quarantine clearings now. We thought we may have seen some elephants there from way the other side. Let me plug myself in so that the dulcet tones of Kirsten McLennan Smith might once again fill my head. Ah, there it is. Oh, there are no further tracks of this line coming up here, so I... Oh, no, hang on, there they are. They are. They're on the road here. They're going up this way. They've been driven over. There is a bit of construction work going on. You've seen how uh, twin dams or treehouse dam has been made a lot larger. So are all the dams being made larger. And there was a construction vehicle that came down this road earlier on. And he did drive over some tracks there. So this lion did come up this way. I shall be most astounded if we just find him lying on quarantine clearings. But I think Brent was around there earlier today. So 
very, very fresh elephant down around here. Be worth. We'll go up onto the clearings and just, they're going the other way though. We'll go up onto the clearings and be quiet for a while. be mortified as this lion is lying on the clearings here. Oh, some angry impala. We'll just have a listen here for a while. There they go, chasing each other, totally wasting their time at this stage. Still, they are a picture of grace. I love watching them run. I just think it's the most wonderful thing. So completely effortless. Especially, of course, you know, as one gets a little older and one's bones start to creak, so the sort of a flush of running youth becomes that much more impressive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are you eating? You see, he didn't just only bring an archie, he brought himself a fairly substantial breakfast bar I as well. Oh, you found it in the car. Okay, and Brent has some more signal now. Let's go and find out what's happening with his lion tracks. So, the most distressing news is those lions went north into Buffalo's Hook. So, hopefully they'll be back to visit on the sunset safari. So, I'm going to take a delve into the western sect, southwestern sectors of Juma. And this is where Karula was last seen. And I'm really hoping to find some nice fresh tracks. I'm convinced that the cubs and Karula have, are still on Juma. We just haven't managed to find where. So, Karula is the dominant female leopard in this area, and she's got two little cubs of about four months old who are just to die for, to be honest. And I'm really hoping we can find her. I think she's probably going to kill in one of the bigger blocks, and I think she might be utilizing the little creek system between Zoe's road and uh, Rebecca's road uh, to keep those cubs while she's hunting. Uh, fingers crossed that we have a little bit of luck in that area. Now, Jamie told me something very interesting yesterday. She thinks she, on her way to Tingana, she found shadows tracks coming into, into Juma. And going into an area that she used to leave her last cub, Simbile, often. So, sh shadow is a bit, of a bit of a nasty leopard when you're on foot. She does growl and snarl and charge quite easily. And if she's got a cub, it's more likely to do so. So, we, we're just trying to stay away from that area for now. But I'm, I'm definitely going to go in there and check uh, one of these days. But if she does have the cub there, we don't want to disturb the area too much. We want her to settle and settle on Juma so we can see her more often. Um, I've had one tiny brief view of that cub through much foliage. Uh, I wouldn't actually even call it a view. So she did have two. She's lost one. We're not sure how she, she lost the, the second cub. It is more than likely in this area from another male leopard. So of the known leopard cub mortalities, about 70% are done by other leopards and specifically male leopards. And the rest are whole various things. I mean, there's some amazing and fascinating records of how cubs have died in this part of the world. I think the strangest one I've ever seen in the Saudi Sands is we had, uh, we, it was a very difficult sighting because we actually watched it. It was very sad, but it is nature, so we don't interfere. We actually watched a big African rock python eat two tiny little leopard cubs. And uh, it, was, it was quite distressing, but it is nature at its, its most raw. And, and even though it's very difficult to watch, for me, it's probably at its, its most poignant, most beautiful.
Okay, well, what have we got walking down the road here? Oh, lots of little things. And it looks like our side stripe jackal have been around here again. Well, hello, Justin. Justin would like to know what it takes to become an excellent tracker and what would I consider to be an exceptional tracker. So, Justin, to be honest, as, as trackers go, I'm probably about as dog average as you can get. Um, there are some gentlemen out here who are absolutely amazing and, and I've been very fortunate enough to work with a few of them and, and, and that's where the little, if any, skill I, I have has come from. So, I think three guys in particular stand out for me as being absolutely incredible trackers. One was the gentleman I spoke about a little bit earlier when we got charged by the lions, a guy by the name of Glass Marmani. And the man is a magician. He can see stuff that you can't see. He tracks lions over, over, over dollarite rocks and can see where the lichen's been slightly disturbed. Uh, and another one, and, and another great, great man, unfortunately, who passed away very recently. It was, a, it was a man I shared a birthday with as well. So when I arrived at London Lazy, about a week after I arrived, it was my birthday. And it turned out it was my tracker was also his birthday. So I was turning, I think, 24, 25 um, at the time. And, and he was turning 61. <laughs> and he had been tracking for over 30 years. Now, a lot of trackers are able to, to follow footprint to footprint. The truly exceptional trackers think like animals. So we'd find leopard tracks, for example, here going like this. And, and Matabula is sit there go, let's go there. We'll find it there. And, and I mean, the opposite direction to the tracks goes, no, this female should that. So you could predict the animal's movement. Now, you can't do it every single time, but every now and then, or uh, well not every now and then, actually, probably about five out of ten times, he would get it spot on. So if you don't get it spot on, you can always go back and follow track to track. And then there's the third gentleman, is actually a gentleman who we've seen recently, he came up and did some training with us, is uh, Renia Simfrongo. Uh, again, I mean, the amount of knowledge stored in that man's brain about animals and how they move and little twist of a toe and that's why I did this is absolutely incredible uh, and I know there's a couple of there's, there's certainly a, quite a few more really exceptional trackers out there but I think for me in, in my time in the bush in South Africa those three stand out now before I moved down to South Africa I was really privileged uh, to work with another man who's, who's passed away and he passed away quite a few years ago his name was David David did not speak a word of English he was half San, half in the Bele, and came from a, an area called Pandamatenga on the border of Botswana and Zimbabwe. And basically was a full-blown poacher by the age of nine, and hunting for the pot. And he got caught, and then he got enrolled in the hunting industry, and he worked as a, as a tracker in the hunting industry for very, many, many years, uh, till my family moved up there, and we found David. My dad is a great believer in trackers and they, they really add to a safari experience. They give the guide time to concentrate and, and talk to the guests and they look for the animals. Now we, David, in terms of the traditional safari tracker, probably was one of the worst because he didn't speak to the guests, he didn't, he didn't even interact with them. He just wanted to find animals and, and I spent many many years in my teens just alone out in the bush with david walking through that massive north, northern botswana we were very very special and i think i garnered a lot from just being in his presence fortunately we were able to communicate in broken in dabele uh, but i think we we both spoke the, the same language and the language of animals and just really loved finding them and he was an expert at tracking everything but what used to happen at about this time of the year, or probably a month or two earlier, my dad used to give him a whole bunch of food, 
and water and a car and say, well, David, you get massive bonus, go find the wild dog dens. And wild dogs are incredibly difficult to track. Now, the area in Botswana is not like the Sabi Sands. The Sabi Sands is 60,000 hectares, myriad of roads crisscrossing. Uh, we, in Botswana, the concession we used to operate in was 232,000 hectares. So over half a million acres, and we only had two lodges. And so uh, not a lot of roads, not a lot of anything. So David used to disappear for about five or six days, and used to sleep in the car, take his food and water, and uh, for 12 years in a row, he, got the, he used to find those dog dens every single time. And not only one pack, he used to find three different dens in the space of five days. And uh, incredibly challenging part of the world to, in terms of finding that type of stuff. And he was a magician. I was lucky enough to go on some of those dog expeditions uh, during my school holidays. And uh, that's, a, that's probably the four trackers, I think, who, who shaped my love for tracking. And I wish I was half as good as any of them. So Brian's asked a very question, what is the most exotic animal I've found in Juma? Um, well, I think I didn't find it. I know it appeared on the dam cam one night. It was a sable antelope, which is pretty exotic, beautiful antelope. But I think the most exotic creature I've ever found in Juma, Jandre was actually with me. And uh, we were driving on our way to a leopard sighting, and suddenly we saw this leopard with something in its mouth going up a tree. And I think my exact words, oh, it's got a stern dog. And that was Sindile, uh, who unfortunately caught a rabbit dog, or a dog that tested positive for rabies. He's gone into quarantine, and he's, he's now about two years old, and he's been re-released into the Saudi Sands with a collar. So he had to be in quarantine. He had to go through a series of injections um, or vaccinations for the rabies. And uh, he's so far doing well. We don't know exactly where he is, but he's somewhere. In, in the Sabi Sands and, and lovely to have him out in the bush again. He does have a collar on um, for monitoring and a very, very, very fancy and sophisticated collar. So because he's a young male, that means he's going to grow, yeah, sort of a collar that fits him now is not going to fit him in a year or two's time. So it's basically got a drop off feature. So once it gets too tight, there's a sensor in it that picks up and that collar just pops off automatically, which is incredible, and there's been huge advancement in a lot of the satellite collar uh, tracking and stuff like that. Speaking of tracking, we're not finding many tracks around here. Now, I am going to go have a quick squiz at a little bush baby nest that's just down the road. And, uh, Maybe we might be able to see a little bit of a little boar of fur. Uh, the main reason I want to go there, because I think it's going to be quite difficult from the vehicle to show it to you. It's just uh, for genre, next time he's on bushwalk, so you know where it is, because it's, it's nice and low, so you can actually probably get the camera looking into it. Oh, hi. So while we meander towards the bush baby nest. Uh, let's go see what Commander Bond is up to. Well, I've just heard some elephants and Buffelsook Dam is over there, so that's where we're going. But, you know, yesterday I was talking about, you know, sitting on a log and eating a piece of grass as Huckleberry Finn or Tom Sawyer might have. And of course, no two grasses are created equal. And so, one must find the ultimate contemplative grass-chewing stalk. Yesterday's was a Simba Pogan Excavatus. Well, it has a very nice name. It tastes like turpentine. And you try, that's not very good. And so this one 
which looks like a very old piece of pannikin. No, in fact, I don't know what, no, probably an old piece of aerogrostis. No, this one's a bit better. It's got that nice sort of sweet straw taste. Yeah, do you like to chew grass every so often? No, no, I'm, I'm not a herbivore. You're not a herbivore? I'm not a grazer. No. I browse. You browse. Well, oh, we can find you something to browse on. We're going to drive a little bit faster so we can get to the dam. And let us just bear in mind that we are on a road called Hyena Road, which means that if you are having, happening to, or if you do happen to have a drink on your lap or in your hand, it's quite likely to end up on your lap as we drive along this road. Not ideal. Now the lion tracks that we saw came out on the road again and they headed off towards this direction. That's why we're on this road. And they are, it's quite interesting. We saw a female lion the other day or two nights ago and she headed off on exactly the same path. She turned off towards this road and I suspect on one of the many game paths that go towards Bovosuk Dam. So we were just wondering if he hadn't perhaps collapsed in exhaustion on this road or maybe he's gone to hyena to the, to the dam and maybe that's what those elephants are shouting at. We will see you when we get there. Now, one of the reasons this road is not in such a fly state, of course, I'll just quickly stop here, is to show you these natural pans. Now, when we talk about a pan, what we mean is a natural piece or natural clay depression, if you like, that will hold water. And they normally happen at the end of what we call a seep line. And this is the end of a seep line. And it's an area where there's a sort of subsurface barrier to the water. And so the water is either held on the surface or it bubbles up from uh, underneath the surface. It's very characteristic or characterized by these silver cluster leaf trees. And that's why the road ain't so fly because of course it does hold water. Oh dear, that is not good news. I think that was driver error rather than machine error. You'd agree with that, wouldn't you, Vian? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought you would. Rachel, you say when a guide moves to a new area, how long does it take to, for them to figure out the nuances of the animals and the territories and basically what's going on? Well, it depends very much on the size of the area. So an area like this, not very big, and so, I mean, it didn't take me much more than... I don't know, look, you still learn something new on this reserve every single day. But to learn basically the layout of the territories, Karula's territory, Shadow's territory, Tingana's territory, <clears throat> Those are the three main leopards that we see here. Um, I do a month or so, I guess. A little bit longer to get completely au fait with the road network. And then you just, you will pick, I mean, the longer you hear, obviously, the more familiar you become with all the little aspects or nuances of the landscape. And then much longer if you want an in-depth understanding, perhaps, of the personalities of the, the different animals have that we see regularly. And many of you, of course, have been watching for far longer than I've been driving around here. And therefore, your knowledge and experience of, say, Karula, the Queen of Juma, our famous 12-year-old female leopard, uh, your knowledge is much greater than most of the presenters because you've actually been observing her for that much longer. But I'd say about a month before you were pretty comfortable with the lay of the land and what's going on. But on a much bigger piece of land, say, I don't know if you were going to go and work at Singita Lavombo, for example, which is in the far western sector, or at least eastern section of the Kruger National Park. I mean, I think that concession is in excess of 15,000 hectares, which is about 35,000 acres. Now, I mean, to learn your way around there and figure out what's going on, especially given the fact that it's, it's much wilder than this in so much as it has a much less uh, or much sparser road network. To find out what's going on there, I think it would take you a few years. 
to really get a handle on all of the territories and all of the animals that were moving around on a vast expanse of wilderness like that. So it really does just depend on the area. What a wonderful question. Justin, I'm not sure why you've picked 90 years, but you say, what do I think the Kruger National Park will look like in the, less, in the next 90 years? I don't know. I think, though, <coughs> our knowledge and our understanding of conservation is moving towards one of a much more hands-off approach where we understand, or we've come to the realization that our understanding of the variables at play in a natural system can never probably be uh, enough for us to predict and therefore actually manage, actively manage an area. And we've come to the realization that an area like this does a much better job of managing itself without us. And so if we can continue along that and continue and accept that perhaps we have to look after a piece of land beyond the time horizon of, an, of a human life, then I think that it will look pretty good. I imagine the bush will get a little bit thinner, to be honest. And if you know, if they allow the elephants to just develop into the numbers that they that they would perhaps naturally, and I think yeah, I think it, otherwise it'll look pretty similar. Uh, this is presuming that political will keeps the Kruger National Park as it is now. There's nothing at the Hussuk Dam except one heron. and a Buffelshoek vehicle full of friendly people who are waving at us. Either because they've seen something, I don't think they have. So there's the grey heron. I don't know where the hippopotamus has disappeared to. Oh, there, was a, there were two hippo here yesterday, weren't there? The, Yes. Alas, they have gone away. Typical. As have the elephants that were yelling in this area earlier. But it is just very peaceful to sit and watch the time go by in a place like this. Now that grey heron is just patiently waiting for some kind of aquatic life to bump him in the foot and then he'll n his beak will shoot down into the water at a quite astonishing speed and in front of him there you can also just maybe see the surface of the water being broken by some serrated hinged terrapins just little ones and you can hear the shout of the grey go-away bird Oh, there's also, there's quite a lot of bird life here. VMP, there's also a, a wagtail, pied wagtail. Can you see him there? You're pretty much on him. Hmm? Yes, there's two of them. Justin, of another very nice question. You say, what's one bird in South Africa that I'm still dying to spot that never have? Um, I don't know, actually. I, I'm trying to think of it. You know, uh, it, there's a very obvious one, and it's pretty common. Uh, I've not seen it here, obviously. I've never seen it. Um, it's something called <laughs> an orange-breasted waxbill. And it's not uncommon. And many people have seen it, most people have seen it. It is possibly seen in this area, uh, but I've actually never seen one. And that's a pretty common bird for most, I mean, most birders have seen it. Most people who are serious about seeing birds, I just think it's the most pretty bird. And how I've failed to see it uh, makes me feel greatly distressed in my heart. Anyway, that's the orange breasted waxbill. But there are lots and lots of birds, Justin, that I haven't seen that are absolutely magnificent. But many of them found, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, many of them <coughs> found 
in what we call uh, southern Africa, so they'd be found north of the South African border. Something like an Angola pitta, for example, is a fantastically colourful bird that I would love to see. Here is Tommy coming past. Good morning. Okay. How are you all? Good, wonderful to see you. That is a very large camera lens. I don't know why you got out of bed. You could probably have photographed most of the reserve lying where you were. Very misty, so oh, it was misty. Okay, fair enough. Is there? Good heavens. My camera's bigger than yours. Um, th there were some male lion tracks heading from um, the Gari, uh, the yeah, Gari cut line junction with Central, um, but I haven't seen them pop out. And did you hear the elephants shouting? Uh, there was some shouting around here, but there is only the call of the uh, chin spot batters to keep us company at the moment. They're on Chitwa Chitwa. Yeah. yeah, but apparently in very deeply thick bush. Yeah. Yeah. So we could go down there and possibly beat. Yeah, we'll employ some locals and go and beat, beat a bit there. Yeah, good idea. <laughs> All righty. Very well. We're very well. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Where are you staying this time? Milkbury. Okay. We'll we'll get hold of you. How long are you there for? Okay. Got much oh dear, that's no good at all. <laughs> all righty, enjoy. All right, everyone, I think let's move on from here. Those are uh, some landowners from Bukhushuk, wonderful people who I met at another time of my life. Their, um, their daughter was a friend of a, an ex-girlfriend of mine. She, of course, is subsequently happily married, uh, not to me, of course. Now, I was very sure the elephants were crawling around here, but those guys say they didn't hear them, but I don't think they've been here for very long. The tracks haven't come out, so let's go down the road here and into this drainage system. Maybe the male lions, ooh. A female lion, but very old track. Let's keep going along here. I'm going to pull around the corner here and then we'll turn off and have a listen and see if we can't find something in the air to hear. And we'll go around to that area where we saw that female lion the other night. And morning glory, you want to know what a nyala alarm call sounds like? Well, I'll stop here and while we have our listen, I'll attempt to give you an impression of it. Um, I'm not very good at it, and I imagine the facial expression that I give is going to be fairly unpleasant to watch. So um, if you are watching with a sensitive viewer, I would suggest that you probably close your eyes now or blindfold them. What it does is it makes a bark, much like the kudu does. The nyala, the kudu, and the bushbuck all have that low-frequency bark sound, and it goes a bit like this. I don't think I've ever done it before. I'll try. Oh. Yeah, that's not bad, actually. Oh. That's what it sounds like. A little bit like that, a little bit deeper than that. Don't look at me like that, VM. Are you not impressed? Well, if I hear that sound in, hmm? in the bush, I will immediately start looking for... A dog? Or something like a Bigfoot or... You know. A Bigfoot, yeah. right. So it sounds a bit like Bigfoot when it's alarm calling, but that is basically what it sounds like. It's probably a much lower frequency than that, uh, but you may have heard that during the night at the Juma Dam camp. 
어. 어. The arm looks terrified, everyone. No one asked who snored last night, James. Shut up. I didn't snore. I did snore. It's impossible. I heard you through the wall. You did not hear me through the wall. Do not cast aspersions on my sleeping habits to people who have no way of knowing whether you're telling the truth or not. I recorded. Given that you did not tell us about the vast array of picnic that you brought to yourself this morning, I feel that you shouldn't be talking about my snoring. What a dreadful accusation that is. I see. Now, I'm, now I'm at a slight, I have to tell you, I'm at a slight loss as to where anything has gone on this reserve. But this is where the lion tracks were heading towards. And we had the female in a clearing just down here two nights ago. see if she's still there. Well, she's definitely not still there, but we'll see if maybe he didn't go there. Now, Luke, you want to know what my favorite bush or plant is? Well, the great thing about bushes and plants, Luke, is that unlike lions and leopards, they're unable to move. And so I should be able to find you my favorite bush or plant. My favorite tree is something called a loaf of milkberry. Uh, but I've shown you that before and I'll try and find, I don't know if I have a favorite bush. Um, no, I don't suppose I do. You know, I think it probably is the loaf of milkberry. If we find one, I'll, I'll show that to you. I'm just going to go around the corner and reminisce about the time, the first drive back. Brian and I had, it was so easy, we found a lion lying right over there in those clearings where there is currently no lion. I will stop, however, and tell you something interesting. Such is the kindness of my nature. Now, this particular plant uh, is Sorry, the car is sneaking forward quietly. It's okay, that's there. One second. I'll shut up. Right, this particular plant has a wonderful name. And, uh, well, there are a few nice names out here. The best one probably being Zizifus. And one should always say that as if one is feeling a bit down. Saying Zizifus makes you feel better. This one is called Gymnosporia buxifolia, and I think that's a great word, uh, otherwise known as the common spike thorn. But what is interesting about it, far more than the actual tree itself, is the lichen growing on it. And I've explained this before, but I find it amazing every time I see it. But lichen, which you will find all over the world in different species, is a combination, a sort of evolutionary combination of fungus and algae. The algae provide the chlorophyll that the lichen will use to feed itself and the fungus, as far as I'm aware, provides this kind of structural material and it's able to sort of attach itself to various different plants. And you'll find them all over the world. I think you find them in um, uh, you find them just about, I think you find them on every continent. I think you may even find them in Antarctica, if I'm not mistaken. And they'll, find, they'll live on rocks, they'll live in trees, they'll live all over the place. And they're a completely separate kingdom. So we often, you know, especially if we're in sort of junior biology, we learn of the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom, and we tend to think of them, you know, those being the only two kingdoms. Well, this is an entirely different kingdom on its own, the lichens. Amazing. Don't you think, Ben? Good. Good answer. On we go. Oh, plugged myself in again. Brent Leo Smith is filming again. Well, he's not filming, Jean Ray. Oh, thank goodness. Brent's actually found a mammal for you to look at. What a relief. So, 
we're sitting amongst a herd of about 60 or 70 elephant. And this inquisitive female has walked up to give us a sniff. She's no more than about seven or eight feet from the vehicle at the moment. And you can see from her body language, she's really relaxing. Ears are flapping, tails wagging. So not perturbed by our presence at all. Hey, madam. And you can see she's a very much a left tusked elephant. So you can see she doesn't have the biggest ivory. And you can see how well worn that left tusk is. So she uses that for feeding. Oh, look at that. She's giving us a sniff. Oh, and a little one made a bit of a noise behind her. And that's changed her body language. You can see how she's, she's a little bit less comfortable. Not, by no means angry or aggressive just yet. But she was just a little bit more alert there. There we go. Ooh, looks like she might give herself a little dust bath right next to us. Oh, isn't that just absolutely gorgeous? Magic. Nice cool dust in the morning. It has heated up quite a lot already. Now these big herds of elephants have been spending a lot of time in this area and there's a little spot just down the road when we were in the height of the sort of summertime drought. The elephants actively cleared an area. Now I know a lot of you out there are quite worried about the, the drought and what's going to do to the animals. Drought is not a bad thing. It is part of the system and it's nature's way of controlling certain the number of certain species and even more particularly with bushes we've had a very wet eight or nine years so there's a lot of young bush around and at the moment the elephants are feeding very heavily on that so it's going to open up these crests a bit more and it's going to give the chance for a grass the grass to have a, a bit of time to recover so it's going to be nice, we're going to have a lot more grass, which often means we get a lot more grazing species. Zebra, wildebeest, buffalo. There we go, another Ellie is joined. And you can see that elephant at the back is feeding off a round leaf teak. Now, in the areas where you've got lots of elephants, round leaf teak very rarely gets bigger than what you're looking at now. The elephants literally almost farm it. Now, in an area where there are no elephants, they become massive trees. But here, the elephants keep it nice and short and keep it growing so they can feed off it. Hey, madam. See how she uses her, her foot to dislodge the dust and then her trunk to suck it up. Oof. And he said dirt was bad for you. Look at, look at that, as she breathes, you can actually see the sand and, and the little sticks moving right in front of her trunk. I must say, we've had such special moments with Ellie's. And I don't think you can ever get tired of these wonderful creatures. She's biting her trunk now, Brian. Look at that. She's got it. She looks like she's been sort of chewing on her trunk. Oh! <laughs> Bless you. I'm almost like maybe she was, it almost looked like she was trying to force herself to sneeze there for a second. Hey. Yeah. See how she's pointing her trunk towards us, just getting a sniff. And she's probably smelling Jandre. You can hear Jean Drake cackling in the background. As I said, quite a big herd. I guess around 60 or 70. And all that beeping you hear behind me is Jean Drake again. Of course, as I told you, anything that goes wrong was slightly annoying today. It's all his fault. Uh, he's using a little machine to film us filming the elephants. So. so 
So, an elephant's trunk is a very prominent feature. I'm just going to move back a little bit. I think they're going to pop out in, onto the open area at a pile of plants. And we can actually have a, a good look at how many eddies there are as they move out of the, the broadleafed woodland. And so there we go. Yes, I'm sorry. Shake your head at me. You're very big. You're very scary. Oh, hello, hello. Very interesting, very interesting indeed. Not only do we have all these elephants around us, but we've got female leopard tracks. Hmm, very small track. I'm pretty certain it's our resident female in the area, Karula. Of course, we're not going to get out and track these tracks. This is in the middle of a herd of elephants. But very really interesting. So, just from the size of the tracks, I'm really sure it's Kula. She's got very small little dainty feet. I'll show you the track in a second, but let's just stick with Eddie's while we can. I'm just try to get Brian a better angle. He's sitting quite cockeyed at the moment. So, as you see, that very long, prominent thing in the middle of the elephant's face, its trunk. And Jen Ward's wondering, do they breathe through that? Yes, they do. It's a specially modified nose. So, they do breathe, and they use it for drinking, feeding, dust bathing. It's an incredible, incredible appendage. Now, depending on what you define muscles as, uh, an elephant has a hundred and hundred thousand different muscles in its trunk. And yeah, so let me just show you quickly. I'm obviously not going to get out of the car to show you that track. Did I drive her over it? Well, uh, no, I didn't. Yeah, let's just get some light on it. There we go. Okay. You see it, Biba? No. Okay, let me just figure out where we are on the camera. There's the grass. Here go towards that elephant track there, or oh, that one, sorry, and then come there. there. There it is. Okay, so she's around, but of course we're not going to be doing too much walking around. Oh, here comes another Ellie crossing the road. And here we go. So we're going to wait for these elephants to move out into the big open area. And while we do that, James has got a spiral horned, I don't know, to show you. We've got quite an interesting situation here, everybody. That's obviously a male Nyala, a very impressive bull. But behind him is a young female. And, I mean, she looks like she's almost a calf. She's less than half his size. But they do seem to be consorting with each other in a manner which might be described as romantic. Uh, he certainly made an, a sort of brief attempt to mount her, and she did not look averse. She kind of stood her ground, and there she is there. And so it's quite an interesting situation. I would have thought she was too young, but uh, that's I'm, I'm clearly quite wrong. There aren't any others around, so I would have put her, I mean, how old do I think she is? She's probably, she's probably just under two years old, so probably just maybe into her first estrus. Now, Nyala will be slightly less seasonal breeders than something like an Impala. They won't be quite as strictly seasonal, but this would still be late in the season for them to be mating, I would have thought because it will put the birth date, uh, I think their gestation's around seven months, so it will put the birth around June, July, August, December, oh, well, sort of late December, yeah. So, it, in fact, this is probably a pretty good time for them to mate. I don't think it is too late, actually. It would be late for a kudu, which is with a slightly longer gestation, but maybe for the nyala it isn't. In the meantime, as Viam says, they're just looking like they're not doing anything at all by chewing the cud. 
us? No, no, we're just chewing the cud. Just quickly in on the on the cow there. Vim, I think she's eating strychnos. It's quite interesting. She's eating that black monkey thorn, everybody. Not thorn, uh, black monkey orange. And I seldom see any animals eating that tree. It's a sort of tall, scraggly, encroacher species that grows in areas seemingly where there are a lack of elephants. And I've very seldom seen browsers take it. That's interesting. And it's called strychnos, of course, because the seeds contain strychnine. And as Eugene found, Eugene is our technical whiz in the camp, as he found, much to his distress a little while back, he got spiked by a piece of the branch there. Oh, here we go. And it took the cut a very long time to heal. I mean, if you didn't know, everyone, you would say that those are two different species completely. He is so much bigger than her, a completely different colour. She's now hiding behind the bush. This is fascinating. I don't want to move, everyone, I'm afraid, because it will give them a fright. So I know they are behind the bush, but you know. That's really interesting. You can see she's she's not even vaguely averse. Just eating her strychnos. It's a lovely shot of her there. Fascinating, fascinating. Let's carry on. We did hear some elephants off to the right-hand side of where we are now, down in the dip, uh, but we're not going to drive off through there. And as you know, we're not allowed to drive off road for elephants at the moment for the duration of the drought. Really interesting, that. No further lion tracks. Don't know where he's gone, I'm afraid. Starting to warm up nicely. Vim's just taken off his jacket. And I think we're in for another glorious winter's day. I mean, there are not many parts of the world where you can enjoy sort of uh, 75 degrees Fahrenheit in the middle of winter, or 24 or 5 degrees Celsius. We are, of course, also waiting, or we, you know, driving past this area on a fairly regular basis, hoping that maybe the lioness with her cubs in Torchwood might bring them this way. Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, they're probably at about two weeks old now, maybe three weeks, and so it's probably another three weeks before they start moving with their mother. A piece of road, this. So I think it's probably early days for them to be wandering down here. Anyway, now what often happens is that the lion tracks that come across from where we saw those ones pop out here, <laughs> and they disappear down over the boundary. But these ones are coming in, like you say, Vian. But some of them are going out. There's the male. That's a female, going up and down. I'll just try and see if we can get a nice view for you to have a look at them. Well, here's a bit of a view. <laughs> uh, one should always look around, of course, see if one doesn't stand up behind a bush in front of you. So here's a lioness. And these are not fresh. These uh, will, A, they've been driven over, and B, I think I saw them here the other night when we found the lioness not too far from here when she was roaring. The male yes, 
this one right here. Have you got one? But the female are coming up and, mm, you know, where have you got the male? Um, do you see that female? Yeah. yeah. Here's the male here. And he's got a much bigger hand. You can see his, his foot is pretty much the same size as my hand. And while I don't have an enormous hand, um, it's still a pretty impressive size. Here he's turned around as well. He's done a bit of a circle around here. We're going to go up to the cut line there and just see if he doesn't pop out there. Somebody did drive down here. I wonder if it wasn't that Biffle's hook car. Yeah, reattach myself. Okay, on we go. He's come wandering along here. So we'll drive out onto the eastern boundary. He's come straight down this road here. Now, just bear in mind, I mean, this is a single male on his own. He's not, it doesn't look like a very big male at all. And maybe it's Junior, our old pal Junior. And we don't want him around here. As Jamie was saying the other day, we don't want him around where there are cubs because that are not his. Because we do know that lions show disturbing propensity to infanticide. So although I know many of you would be happy to see him again, Junior, by the way, is a four-year-old male who was born to the Nkuhuma pride in whose territory we are currently sitting. He was then tossed out by the or he ran away from the incursion of the Birmingham boys. Have they gone off down there, Liam? Straight over. Straight over the top of the road. So that's that then. Uh, and those Birmingham boys have now sired cubs with his pride, with his natal pride. And so we don't really want him around anymore, I'm afraid. Nice question from James Richard, which of course we could probably sit and shoot the breeze with for, for hours. But your question is, in my opinion, what is the most primitive predator out here from an evolutionary point of view? Now, remember that you mustn't think of evolution as a, um, as a kind of 